joining me this morning is Deputy Executive Director Nathan Byerly, and he's going to be talking about specificity and the right to know law. A uh, couple uh, preliminary things to get out of the way before we dive into the topic. Um, first is that this session is essentially a PowerPoint presentation with Nathan talking uh, in the background. The PowerPoint in a couple days will be loaded on our website and uh, you go over to the training tab, scroll down and you'll find all of the PowerPoints that we use on our training sessions. You're more than welcome to download them and use them as you see fit. It may be that you had a colleague who wasn't available this morning, or maybe you're conducting localized training and uh, you know these materials will be of use to you. Uh, we're glad to uh, let you use whatever you need to, to use. Okay, Karen M has indicated that she doesn't have sound. Um, if you can hear me, would someone type in the chat feature that the sound is coming through okay? We just want to confirm that. Okay, we do have sound. So Karen, the problem is on your end and you can't hear me saying that. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs> Let's get back into this. Um, okay, so the PowerPoint is available. Also, the session is being recorded. Uh, and the way we work that is that in a couple of days, one of the admin staff here will upload the recording to our YouTube channel. And then we create a link from the YouTube channel to the website. And yeah, the web, you're going to be able to find the recording on the website and the same conditions apply. You know, you might uh, find it helpful for localized training, uh, your own reference, or maybe you have colleagues who weren't able to attend, so they'll have uh, uh, the benefit of being able to listen to the recording. Now, as far as questions go, feel free to type in the chat feature as we're proceeding through the uh, presentation. Uh, two conditions, though. First is that, you know, we are talking about specificity and the right to know law, so we want to stay on topic. But just as important, if you can keep your question, this is a hard one, if you can keep your questions as brief and succinct as possible, that would be very helpful. Uh, honestly, it, it's just awkward sometimes to sit and read through several paragraphs of some questions while everyone else is waiting patiently. Now, I'm going to be uh, uh, the co-pilot here, so I'll be able to read the questions while Nathan's presenting, but still, I, I think you understand the uh, the issue here. So if you can keep uh, your, your questions on point and as brief as possible, I think that would be helpful for everybody. Okay, that takes care of all the preliminaries. I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to Nathan. Good morning, Nate. Good morning. Thanks, George. Um, specificity. Um, quite the topic to try to cover. I'm going to cover uh, hopefully as much as I can in, in the hour that we have. Um, this this issue probably alone is the top one uh, that we deal with at the Office of Open Records. It comes up uh, a lot in different appeals uh, with kind of joking and preparing for this that in looking at some of the confusion that agencies face with this issue, um, it's part art part science and complete confusion. And <laughs> it's kind of the joke we say on that, but you know, sometimes that is how it feels. But um, before I jump into that though, I wanna say that this presentation is not legal advice and it's not binding authority. So anything that I say here, don't cite to in a uh, appeal that you might have before the Office of Open Records. Um, if you're a requester listing, uh, you know, don't necessarily run to the agency and say that the Office of Open Records has established this as policy. Uh, that is not what these uh, webinars are intended for. Uh, another thing related to the part art, part science, complete confusion uh, joke that we kind of talk about from time to time is definitive answers in this unfortunately don't always exist because reasonable minds can sometimes differ on what is a specific request. So when you look at even appeals that come through, the agency may take one view uh, in it in the appeal, the requester another, the OOR could take a different approach viewpoint, the Court of Common Pleas, then the Commonwealth Court, even the Supreme Court, all with judges and people having uh, different takes. Um, and that's why in each uh, case, the facts of each individual case are very important and a lot of times very determinative. Um, it's a very context sensitive issue that we look at on a case by case basis. And just as a heads up, parts of the presentation are going to overlap and repeat themselves. I think that's just the nature of this issue, and it's good that they do so because repetition aids learning. 
So now that you've heard that and go, well, these reasonable minds can differ, you know, what in the world is the point of all of this anyway? And the point of this is, and my goals are, is to give you some tips and discuss the legal factors of the three-part test that we use at the OR, that the courts use in determining uh, whether a request is sufficiently specific. And we're also going to discuss, and I'll give you throughout here, some, just some tools you can use both as a requester and an agency to hopefully come to a reasonable conclusion if you're trying to determine whether or not a request is specific. And if you're a requester, uh, some tips and tools to use to draft a reasonably uh, specific request. So um, related to that, additional resources. And then I want to highlight right here, I hope I highlight it throughout because the issue of you know, records management is uh, very important to the issue of specificity. I will likely probably forget as we go through to talk about it, even though it is important because a lot of us overlook it. But make sure as agencies that you are, you know, following the guidelines that you're supposed to, following your retention policy. Because if you get a right to know request, say for a lot of emails, FYI emails, you know, the meeting changed from this room to that room, from this time to that time. That's a lot of extra information and records to go through that don't necessarily need to be retained. Transitory emails don't necessarily need to be retained. So um, that's a very important thing to make sure that your retention policy is up to date. And not only that it's up to date, that you are following it. So some general observations before we um, really get into the uh, details of it all is, you know, first off, when these come, when you get a right to know request, uh, Use common sense. And a lot of people joke and say, you know, common sense is um, common sense is dying in our world today, it feels like sometimes. <laughs> um, so still uh, pick up on um, what you're um, seeing through the plain language of it. Use your common sense in, in applying these and try to work through uh, that component of it. Uh, also, another thing I never thought I'd have to say is, you know, be be polite, common sense, common courtesy. Um, we see an increasing number of uh, situations where people are behaving in a less than polite manner, and we see it on both sides. And I look at it first off, you know, let's let's be polite to each other to be nice, you know, do to other people what you would want done to you. But even if you do it for selfish motives, think of this from the requester standpoint. If you're rude and angry to the agency, how much, you know, you're wanting records from them. Are they really going to work with you? And on the agency side, if you're being rude with the requester, you know, isn't that just going to raise red flags to that requester that, hey, I'm onto something here, and then it's going to lead to more right to know requests. So whether you're doing it from a being nice or being a selfish standpoint, let's just try to all be polite and kind to each other as we work through some of these processes and complicated issues. Don't unnecessarily complicate the process. Um, I don't know how many attorneys are on here today, but we are notorious for this as attorneys. Uh, I'm going to go, you know, grab uh, 15 different definitions of this word. I'm going to grab the most ambiguous definition I can. Oh, this case, this request is not specific. Don't don't play the word games that um, can go on sometimes and can be played. Wordsmithing um, does not aid in the process. So before we, we get going um, into even more details, what is the whole purpose? What's the whole point of specificity? Where does this term sufficient specificity come from? And it's actually in the statute. And basically what the component is, is that the request should be specific enough for the agency to figure out what records or what information is being requested. So the purpose is, as an agency, do you know what they are requesting? Requesting What information do they want? It's basically the central question you're dealing with. Um, does it sufficiently, as the court has quoted, uh, does it sufficiently inform the agency of the records requested? So I take a little bit step back and look at some more general observations before we jump into the case law and some more details. But one of the big things we see at the Office of Open Records is a right to know request comes in and the first thought process from an agency may be this is a burdensome request. This is going to take a ton of time. This is going to take a ton of work. This is going to take a ton of agency resources. While burdensome may be a factor, um, it is typically if only the only reason raised for specificity uh, specificity defense, it's not going to succeed. Um, 
the burdensome, like I said, burdensome can be a factor in it. We have cases where we have seen like literally terabytes of information requested, usually in the more voluminous cases uh, where both sides understand what's being requested. There will be a rolling production of documents um, set up either um, not overseen by the OR, but kind of set up and in order by the OR. We've also seen courts oversee um, a rolling production of documents um, set up and the court monitors how many requests can be filed in any uh, given time period, depending on the situation and the uh, relationship between the parties. But some of the issues we would look at if Burdensome was raised is, you know, the burden that's on the agency, how, how much is it and why is that uh, burden and what's the cause of that burden? Is it the number of records requested um, that could impact things? Is it the way the request is phrased that could impact it? Um, is it how the records are organized and maintained by the agency? And if that is the reason, then the agency is not going to be able to likely sustain um, any claim that it's not specific because the courts have said that the way or records are organized and maintained cannot be held against the requester. So um, that is something to consider as well, which I would encourage another from a records management standpoint, make sure your records are organized and maintained in a way that you can respond to right to no requests in an efficient manner. And that continues to change as technology continues to evolve. Um, is, is it from another cause? I mean, we're, you know, for example, we're a really tiny agency. This is for tons and tons of our records. We, we, you know, we need to work something out here so that we can do a rolling production of documents. But again, a lot of times in those cases, as you can see, I'm saying both sides have at least a basic understanding of what's being requested, which again, is why that um, type of argument uh, will likely fail unless it's an extremely burdensome uh, request. And I, I say that from the standpoint that that burdensome would be your only argument. Um, if you tie burdensome into the other arguments and factors that we're going to go through, um, that's a different um, case scenario than just saying when you get a right to no request, oh, this is too burdensome. Nathan, can I interrupt here for a second? Uh, a couple questions. A transitory email is one where really there's no substance, no substantive information in, in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the I don't know that there's a set definition of transitory. Um, I know different agencies have different definitions for it, and I'm trying to think of uh, it's basically just um, useless email. So like the FYI email, mm -hmm. and even anything that you're not um, making a decision in at times can also be. Um, in, um, covered by that but um and, and as far as as far as a definition i'd have to go back through and look at i think we've discussed it in a couple of um final determinations and not necessarily thinking off the top of yeah, my head definitely like the, uh, the definition of a record would apply where you know the content of the email in no way reflects the mission uh of the agency right or, or and, activity and transitory emails are still typically records of the agency in conduct business. They, they're still, um, yeah. they're just, I can't think of the term that it's, that's escaping me right now, but it, reach out to me. If you have that question, I can point you in the right direction of the final determinations where we discuss that. And then Christy is asking about the parties, uh, a mutual extension. Uh, yeah, the first 30 calendar day extension is unilateral from the agency. Uh, but there is a provision within the right to know law that if, uh, if you want to go beyond the 30 calendar day extension, you would have to have mutual agreement from both parties and it gets reduced to writing in case things go south in the future. You would have that document available in the event of an appeal. Yeah, and it's, it's vital and crucial that you get that in writing. The, the statutory language is very specific on that. Yeah. And I would encourage to the extent you can with requesters to pose that because it's a it's an act of good faith on the, um, the part of the agency because they're providing records as the process goes. So it gives the requester time to look at them. And if there are redactions made, um, we, we can um, save those up, so to speak, until the rolling production documents is done. And then if the requester is not satisfied, they can appeal to the Office of Open Records and then we can look to see whether or not the exemptions were properly raised. But to the extent that that works, um, that I know that agencies have had that as a successful tool in dealing with burdensome type requests and even in the specificity realm if you sit down with a requester which we highly encourage to talk through what exactly they're looking for uh, that will help the process and everybody work through um, 
the right to know request because really um we'd really like not to be addressing specificity in the appeals it's much easier to get into the exemptions but i, I know this this issue is not going to go anywhere so um just as a reminder to compliance, you know, we, we hear complaints a lot of times from agencies about having to comply with the right to know law and doing uh, the responsibility and duty of keeping up with records access. But it, it's just like any other uh, responsibility or duty that an agency would have. You're going you're gonna to need to use funds to cover all these things I have listed there. So, you know, right to know compliance is just falling in line with other statutory duties and responsibilities. Request may be specific, sufficiently specific. I love the tongue tip twisting uh, process they set up here at the legislature. You know, sufficiently specific. <laughs> How many times can you say that without messing it up? Um, even though it requests broad categories of records. So again, knowing what's being requested is part of the key issue there. And um, one of the things we I kind of, we added to this at the last minute in talking with uh, I'm talking with Kyle, our chief counsel, is generally speaking, the bigger the agency the greater need for specificity, because obviously they have more records. Um, you know, you get into a, a bigger city like Philadelphia, they have a number of different departments and, you know, it's, you want to go in there and A, make sure you're going to the right uh, arrow, but B, making sure you're very specific as to, you know, what records are being sought. Uh, use of the word all. Now, a lot of time early on, I know, um, when a requester used the word all, uh, agencies quickly said, oh, this lacks specificity. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, obviously, when you're using words like any and all, um, another catchphrase is but not limited to, those do raise specificity questions, but the um, any and all is not necessarily uh, a problem type of issue. I say but not limited to is a much more problematic phrase because when you're listing things and then you say, but not limited to, you're basically saying, well, I want everything related, you know, to this. So that, that tends to be a very broad phrase there that's used. And, and it's good to rem remember that uh, the courts have said, and we have said too, that a request can be partially specific. So um, an example here was uh, somebody asked for any and all records, files, manuals, communications of any kind related to step to uh, vehicle stops. Now, you know, it's good that the state police could, you know, give access uh, to these records related to vehicle stops, but how in the world are they going to know, you know, how many vehicle stops do they make in any given month? Um, and they want all records, all files, obviously very broad, but any manuals that relate to vehicle stops, those are very easily identifiable and would be able to be provided. So the court said that manuals is the only part of this request that was specific. Um, so records can be given without waiving the lack of specificity argument too. That's something to remember that um, in this situation, let's say the uh, state police had given the manuals and then the request of appeal, the agency could still raise specificity even though they provided access to those manuals. So to help us work through all this, um, and, and part of this presentation, we just had um, a specificity case come down from the Commonwealth Court within the last two weeks. And we'll, we'll get to that and discuss that um, in, in a little bit. Um, but they created a three-part factoring test. It's gonna take me a while, and I probably will still say balancing test. We've been calling it a balancing test. And one of the things that the court uh, differentiated from was saying, well, it's not really a balancing test like in the constitutional right to privacy sense where you balance, you know, things against each other. This is more of a factoring test. So we're going to, we, we are switching and redirecting the vocabulary here to refer to this as a three-part factoring test or the three-part test um, on specificity. And they broke that down into three categories. We're going to go into each one specifically uh, in the coming slide, subject matter, scope of documents, and time frame. Um, and keep in mind as we, we walk through this, the requests were all the emails of the acting secretary of education uh, as they pertain to the performance of her duties for basically a year. So it was um, very broad and open-ended requests. Uh, and we'll see why that failed and was found not to be specific. But before we jump into those slides, keep in mind, it's not a bright line test. So it's not like you have to have subject matter, you have to have scope, you have to have time frame. 
it's much more fle flexible and um, nebulous, so to speak, than that. Um, we're, it, each case is going to be different, and that's why I said early on, um, you know, it's a case by case factoring type of analysis that um, one little fact could change or one little factor could change the outcome. Um, and it may not necessarily apply specifically to your case that that you have. Um, one of the big things to remember is that these three factors together, uh, working together, um, looked at together, should review should reveal a clearly defined universe of documents. It may be a large universe of documents, but it should reveal uh, the documents and the information that the requester is seeking. So first off, subject matter. And the subject matter is it needs to describe a transaction, incident, activity, event, topic, action, or other agency business um, as it relates to the records requested. So you're not just saying, as we saw earlier, I want all the records of the agency. Uh, you're getting more specific than that. You're saying, you know, to a school district, maybe you want specific um, records that relate to the sports program, you know, the football schedule, or, you know, you're getting more and more specific and just saying, I want all records related to sports, um, or I want all records related to football. You know, that that's very problematic uh, from a subject matter standpoint, not, you know, let alone a time frame if you're just phrasing that way. Um, an open-ended request that gives an agency a little guidance uh, regarding what to look for may be so burdensome that it will be considered overly broad. And we'll see some of these factors discussed in the coming cases as we go through the cases. But, um, you know, yeah, you, gotta, you just can't do open-ended type requests as a requester and uh, expect the agency to um, figure out what's going on on their own and then decipher and interpret that. Specificity must be construed in the request's context rather than envisioning everything that the request might conceivably encompass. So in this situation, there are um, cases that talk about things that are going on within a specific uh, area. Um, there, there's a Department of Corrections case we'll go over. They, so if, if the requester comes to you and it's one of these well-known, everybody knows what's going on and they want records related to this specific, and they don't necessarily say it's related to this specific situation, but by the wording and interpretation of it, it's pretty clear what they're asking for. You know, you as an agency should take that step and look at the request in its context. Um, the agency should be left with no judgments to be made. Um, we'll look at, uh, there's some really great examples. I'm gonna, um, you know, not necessarily go into detail on that here because we will discuss that in the coming slide, which will be a better example to explain it than I can do now. Then there's the scope. So you have subject matter, you have scope. The request should explain the specific type or kinds of records. So you don't want to say if you're a requester, you know, I want all um, records, I want all communications gets to be a little fuzzy, but I want all information, you know, be specific and name the kind of record. I want the emails, reports, formal decisions. If you know you're looking for a specific title, uh, um, document, um, you know, ask for that specific title document. Um, the request should seek records by naming the recipients and or senders, especially in the email context. And I say where possible because there's times you may not know that. But for example, if you're dealing with a school district, um, you know, maybe name some of the people in the departments or the teachers of a specific grade level if you don't know their names or if you know we had one come through with the Department of Corrections where they were naming the different titles that people had, even though they didn't know their names, they were asking for the emails between these people discussing a certain subject matter. So where possible, um, do that as well. And, and you want to avoid saying, you know, basically I want all emails from all employees. Um, that's going to be very problematic from a scope standpoint too. Um, the request should identify a finite period of time. A period of time could potentially be lengthy, and it depends on the rest of the request. Again, we're getting to a factor flexibility um, factoring type analysis here to to reach that point. And there may be a situation where it doesn't have a time frame at all. You know, does the rest of the request give enough detail to allow the agency to identify the specific records that are being requested? Um, again, how much time is too broad? You know, these get into very fact specific, they get into very 
detailed analysis of what the request um, is seeking. And um, so again, uh, not much more detail on that. We'll get into some of the cases to talk about how those cases have, how the courts have handled those types of cases and how we've handled them here at the OR. Um, the Baxter case does not stand for the proposition that a request that is limited to a short, to a short time frame is always by itself sufficiently specific. Um, it, it still could be an overly broad um, request, um, and it, it, again, depending on a number of factors, um, you could have a short time frame. You know, when we're going through COVID, if you ask for emails related to COVID for one week between certain individuals within certain government agencies that could potentially be overbroad just by looking at the sheer volume of um, emails that were being exchanged back and forth during the height of the pandemic. But again, that would be something you would have to look at to determine does the number of emails reach that burdensome standpoint in the volume and compare that to the rest of the request as it's phrased. So again, I think you hopefully beginning to see we're going to work through these factors and you should be doing the same thing as you're trying to um, determine whether or not you think they're specific. And as you work through these, I think it's it's a good thing if you um, identify records as you go through um, that you provide access to those records or you provide a response to those uh, records if they're exempt under an exemption to say, hey, these are the responsive records we have. They're exempt uh, for this reason. Um, and it, it's important too to go look at the records to the extent you can. A lot of times we see agencies try to raise specificity and they haven't gone to look at the records yet or they haven't even gone to see how many there are. So before you raise specificity as a concern, make sure it's an actual concern and it actually can be supported factually from all the records that you're seeking because you know you might reach a situation where you don't know maybe as a solicitor or you don't even know maybe as an arrow that this person doesn't get a lot of emails. So asking for their emails from the last five years, there's only probably a hundred emails. Um, so make sure you know the scenarios that are going on within the um, agency because arguing that you know a hundred e going through a hundred emails is burdensome is going to be uh, quite a stretch. Nathan, there was uh, there's a question here about whether or not the subject matter is required when looking at the other factors, it appears that they're defined rather narrowly. Could the subject matter be implied? Uh, and we'll we'll get to that when we go through the, the case laws. Yeah, that um, that's a good question. And if the case law doesn't answer it when we go through that, um, we'll try to note that and come back to that one. I'm pretty sure we have a case that addresses that. Great. Um, one of the ways that requesters have tried um, over the years to be more specific is to use keywords. So they'll provide a list of, you know, words that can be searched or that uh, that apply to the records that they're looking for. And it's just a list of words that um, are basically to be used as search terms. Um, we have found over the years, they usually add more confusion and clarity. Uh, we re encourage requesters not to use them. However, there are cases where the courts have said that the use of keywords um, is okay. It doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily fatal to the request, but using the broad keywords alone isn't going to be sufficiently uh, specific. And we have, I, I would say, looking, you know, at this historically, that a lot of times the keywords are just too broad. And we have found the lists to be specific to using those keyword lists where they relate to well-known matters of agency business. And again, the request identifies senders and recipients. Um, in using keywords, um, we generally encourage requesters to actually try to provide actual search queries or to provide phrases that an agency can that an agency can use as a search. Um, I found those to be more beneficial than use of the keywords. Now, you have to keep in mind too, that even when you use the keywords, that many times the arrow, or even sometimes agency, the people that are doing the IT within the agency may not understand the search capabilities of their software, of their hardware, of their databases, of the electronic devices. So, 
you know, while you're not required to do so, it might benefit you as a requester, for those of you who are requesters who are listening, to make sure, or if you know they don't, maybe explain, and you know how the system works or how the device works, to explain to them how to do the search or give them a research resource for how to do the search. Um, that way, you know, at least the agency employees have some notice on how to do it. Because there are there are times and it's not, I don't think it's happening as much, but I know there there are still times where we will get um, arguments from an agency saying that you know that they will bring back way too many records and it's just a situation of them um, not knowing how to do the search, or we suspect that it's them not knowing how to do the search. Uh, the OR has previously found that a request for a keyword search where the keywords do not reasonably involve some business of an agency over the course of 19 months was insufficiently specific. So, um, again, we, we try to encourage people to not go the keyword search way, but if you do, try to be specific with those keywords. And, you know, think of it from the context. You're not going to go to a school district and say, you know, I want all records or on all emails between the um, superintendent and the teachers with the, the keyword of math and subtraction or, you know, at, super broad where, you know, there's going to be some potential, um, you know, some potential specificity issues on those. Um, again, I talked about this in running searches and I encourage agencies to make sure you know how to run searches in these, uh, make sure you know, um, the use of the different search tools in the databases that you have. Um, and, you know, we kind of already talked about this in passing. So hopefully that will help um, even as you try to, um, as a requester, phrase it in a way that allows the agency to track down the record and as an agency to be able to use your tools and your um, platforms and programs to uh, find the records that have been requested. So now, uh, now we're just going to go into some of the case cases that have discussed this, because I think these give the best picture. They're actual cases. Um, I didn't start with the most recent. I kind of went at this trying to walk down, starting with a little bit of a simplistic type situation and then getting more and more um, maybe complex as we go along. In this one, the request was police video footage. It was for police video footage on October 4th, a uh, specific date from the time the person was brought into the police department and all activity that day. And the court said this was specific. And why did the court say that? Because the request clearly identifies the subject matter of the request, which was the department um, activity and the requester. The scope of records, it's a video surveillance footage, it's specific type of record that is named. And this one even goes and names a specific time frame. They have a specific single day. Uh, that these records were created. Uh, additionally, there was information in the, the uh, case that was presented in the evidence, in the affidavits that, that reflected that the borough knew which footage would be responsive, which again goes against the argument that would be made in 703 that you know, the whole point of specificity is to understand and to know with certainty what is being requested by the requester. And the evidence in that case demonstrated that the borough likely do. Kind of on the other extreme, we have OIG versus Brown, where the request was for OIG's rules, regulations, policies, or related authority that govern duties functions that were specifically designed by the OIG. And the court said that was not specific. Why not? Because the request doesn't provide any context by which the request can be narrowed. There's no subject matter. There's no category. There's no type of acti activity, duty, function, or even transaction. And basically, um, it's just call it's calling for all the records related to everything that OIG does. And I think it's good to note in these cases um, that when you call, if you're a requester and you're asking for the agency to make uh, interpretate interpretations or legal conclusions, because the request asking say, saying we want regulations uh, policies or related authority that govern its duties you're requiring the oig to figure out which rules give it authority so they're making a legal conclusion and deciding if they give access well this rule 
gives us the authority that requires legal interpretation and analysis. And that is not what you were required to do as an agency. Now, if they file a, a right to know request and said, we want rule, I'm just, I'm just making one up. We want rule 19. Okay. You know, they've named a specific document, give them the rule, but you know, we'll see requests come in and you get appeals that, well, we want to see all the records that give the borough the authority to do X, Y, or Z. Well, you know, you're, you're requiring the borough again to make a legal interpretation and to make a legal analysis there as well. Um, the court also said it was an unreasonable burden to require OIG to examine all its rules, regulations, and policies and related authority and try to figure out basically um, what was being requested and they didn't have the spe sufficient specific specificity that they needed to uh, respond to that request. Um, DOC versus uh, ABC 27. Um, this was for all records that re that document inmate injuries deaths from a five year period. Um, I would also like the records that document employee injuries deaths while on the job from January 2009 to 2014. Again, five year period. This one has an appearance on it of being broad. It also has an appearance of asking for a lot of records, but the court said this was specific. I want to note they didn't use the three part factor test here, but it's the same basic elements when they found this to be specific because it informs the agency of the records requested. It's clearly defined. It's records that relate documents that relate to inmate injuries. It's a specific subject for a specific period of time. It's five years. It's a long period of time, but it's still a set finite period of time. And um, the fact that this was burdensome and required a lot of work on the part of Department of Corrections and involved a lot of records and documents, burdensome does not necessarily deem a request overbroad. And they found that this one was to be specific. Um, and this one's a good, good one to look at with respect to um, working through the context and, or not the context, but this one is good to look at when you're dealing with a voluminous request and it's asking for a lot of records that's going to require a lot of work. It might give you some framework there. Now, here's the one that just came down recently. Um, Office of the Governor versus Briel. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that. I, I Googled it, so if I'm butchering it and um, the person is on here, I profusely apologize. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> I Googled it. Um, requests um, and before I even say that th this is a great this and the Bagwell case which will come up I think on the next slide or the next couple um, this case is great because it goes through and gives a whole um, historical background I think the Bagwell one's a little bit better but it gives a historical background and discusses the history of the court cases addressing specificity so they address a lot of these cases we're going over and they say why they found it be, to be specific and they discuss subject matter and scope. So they're very beneficial cases that give you a good overview of the, his, the court history of um, these specificity cases. So they are very helpful in working through um, whether you're a requester trying to file a right to know request or you're an agency trying to determine if specificity is the right argument to raise a, as a uh, reason for denial. So the request was for all incoming and outgoing emails for the deputy press secretary of the governor's office and all incoming and outgoing email for the press secretary for similar time frames. One was 10 days and I believe one was 20 days. Um, and the court said, and, and I'll, I'll flag this one too. This one still, it just came down within the last two weeks. So this one could still be appealed to the Supreme Court um, I don't know if it will be. I don't have enough knowledge of the of the uh, requester here to know if that's going to get appealed to the Supreme Court, but um, we'll have to wait and see if that happens. But th the court said this was specific because it focuses on two specific people, which serves to limit the subject matter. So that's an answer to the question um, earlier. So there's not really, I shouldn't say there's not really, there's not a subject matter here, but it's short enough that a subject matter is not um, going to, it's it, the subject matter lack of subject matter does not give it uh, problems with specificity 
And communication via email is an activity of the governor's office. So um, it does relate, um, you know, they interpreted the email to be the subject matter being the communication. It's just interesting um, analysis by the court. It identifies a discrete group of documents, emails. So there's no, it's not an open-ended records or all information that the deputy press secretary may have uh, created. It's specific in saying it's emails. Time frames, uh, 10 days and 20 days. It's right, you know, specifically there. Uh, it seeks a clearly defined universe of documents, even if potentially large, because if you don't know, you know, a deputy press secretary and a press secretary, depending on how they, um, you know, conduct their business and handle their position, there could be a lot of emails there, even in a 10 day or 20 day uh, period. And again, that's why I, it's important. Again, I want to, I know I already said it, uh, but just for sake of repetition, uh, it is important that you go look at the records or at least have an idea of how many records you're talking about. And I think it's also important to not overinflate that. We see we see agencies overinflate that number. So let's say you have 30 um, people involved in an email and an email goes out and says, does this work for everybody? And 30 people respond, yes. Um, don't count that and say, oh, 30 people responded. Each one got a yes in their inbox. That's 900 emails. And then multiply that and say, well, we're talking, you know, if, if we start going through all these, you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of emails. Well, you know, technically, yes, but you're talking really, you know, 30 emails confirming that that time works. You're not talking 900 emails, even though you could make the argument that there's 900 emails in the inbox. So. I think you see what I'm saying there. Don't use those types of scenarios to overinflate the numbers, or at least be aware that the possibility of you running a quick search could overinflate the numbers and try to account for that as much as you can. So again, as I just said, it sought a clearly defined universe of documents, even if that was potentially large. Uh, the court said, and I thought this was an interesting comment, it's hard to conceive a scenario where a request seeking emails from two specific people over the course of less than a month lacks sufficient specificity. So I think, you know, in that scenario, um, if you have two people on an email and the request is for all their emails, um, there is, and we're going to have to look at the this when it comes up, but there's the likelihood that could be a specific request based upon that language and how the court analyzed that. Now, the next question, that goes through my mind in this, and we're again, we're going to have to look at this as we go forward. Um, does that scenario extend to four people? How far does that, how many people does it take to get outside this scenario where it's hard to conceive? It's, you know, lacking sufficient specificity. Okay, so is it four people? Is it six people? Less than a month. Well, how about six weeks? How about seven weeks? So as you can see, while this gives us some guidance, um, there's still going to be a case by case analysis to determine whether or not um, one is uh, sufficiently specific. Um, uh, one of the things I want to mention too, if, if there's any requesters listening, listening that you want to think about, um, it just kind of dawned on me and I'm not sure if we come up to it later, but if it gets repeated, that's good because repetition helps us in these scenarios. Um, is if you are told by an agency that you're your request is being denied because it is not sufficiently specific. I encourage you to think uh, very hard and long before filing a appeal with the OR, because if you file that appeal, it is gonna take us 30 days to issue a decision. It's gonna take, um, if it gets appealed to the courts, they're gonna issue a decision. It could be probably a year if it gets appealed to a court, before it makes it back to you. And if the court and the OR decide, yes, um, your request is not sufficiently specific, you're gonna have to start all over. So I encourage the requester, if you get that scenario where you're denied for lacking sufficient specificity, it might be in your best interest to just amend the request, fix the request, try to make it more specific and file it again. Um, I know you get into these situations where you run into agencies um, not interpreting things the way you think they should be interpreted and then the OR has to step in but I would still seriously consider filing a second 
request being more specific and, and even talk with the agency to try to figure out what you can do to narrow your uh, request so that they can figure out what records you're seeking. Wait a minute, did you just say that agencies and requesters are allowed to talk to each other? Yes, they can. And you would be wow. you'd be amazed how much we run into people and uh, uh, agencies and requesters asking if they can talk to each other, not just during the request process, but during the appeal process. You you are free to discuss and work that out amongst yourselves. I know that in certain scenarios, that relationship is so um, destroy that that can happen, but um, a lot of times that's very beneficial for the parties to talk to each other. Here's the Bagwell case that I spoke of earlier. Again, this is kind of still, I think, my uh, case that I prefer with the discussion of the history of specificity before the courts. But the request was, um, and I some of this is edited because it was a rather lengthy one, but all emails, letters, and memos pertaining to the district attorney's office transition from Lotus Notes email platform to the Microsoft Exchange email platform for basically, no, it wasn't for basically, it was for a year. Um, is that specific enough? Yes. Again, clearly defined universe of documents, define the scope by the type of documents sought, and has a finite time frame. And I'm guessing looking at this um, and looking at, again, the size of the agency, the context of what, tr transitioning from one platform to another, I'm guessing that would probably be a rather voluminous right to no request that would need to be responded to. Yet the court found this to be specific. So again, I caution agencies that when you get a request that um, seems to request a lot of records don't automatically say hey this is burdensome um, don't make that your first response it may be but analyze it under the three-part test uh, go look at the records to figure out how many we're talking about and then analyze that request from the context of the three-part test to determine whether or not this is specific and just going to be a lot of work or it indeed is a situation where i have you know, no idea what's being requested. I don't even know where to turn. Uh, Kerry versus Department of Corrections. This was another interesting one and, and one that I was referencing. It talks about the context of the case uh, or of the request. The request was for transfers from 2008 to 2000. Okay, the background of the case. There were transfers from uh, inmates from 2008 to 2012. I think it was between Pennsylvania and Michigan. And they wanted the, the requester asked for all document communications, which may indicate the individuals or agencies who authorized said transfers. And was this specific? The court said yes. All of the records are specified by subject matter, which is the transfers that were from 2008 to 2012. And part two of the request, um, they said that all documents and communications might be a little vague but coupled with the fact that the transfer is well known to DOC, again, the context and what DOC knew, it is sufficiently specific. So if it's a well-known situation within the agency, uh, you're gonna have to apply what everyone knows to that request as well um, before you make uh, a determination with, you know, that you're gonna deny this based upon uh, specificity. Uh, <clears throat> This was the one we discussed um, earlier. One of the interesting, um, oh no, it's not. This is the Laguerre case. I'm confusing this with the Department of Education, uh, the other Department of Education case. Um, so this, this has its own interesting scenario as well, but the request was filed in September 6, 2011. So you were dealing with records from January of 2008 to September. So you're of a 2011. So, several years of records and they wanted these determination letters and uh, the, it was denied because it was not specific enough and the court said yes this is a specific type of document requested determination letters is a specific kind of document we have a clearly defined universe because we have that document we have even though it's several years we have years there there's no judgment that has to be made as to what records are related. We know specifically the determination letters related to, to you know, the GAS Act. Um, the agency provided some records, which goes towards specificity. And this case was from several years back. It doesn't, 
the giving of records is not held against the agency. Um, but in this situation, the way that they provided the records, it demonstrated they knew what was being requested. Uh, again, this is going to be something that's going to obviously take a lot of time to go through because as it came out during the course of the uh, appeals, the um, letters were stored in each individual file instead of in one place. So the agency was going to have to go through each individual file and pull out those letters. And they said, this is too burdensome. And that was not, uh, the court did not accept that as an argument saying that does not equate to not being specific. It just is a way you keep your records and the way you catalog, store, organize your records cannot be held against the requester, which again, um, I go to retention of your records. If you have kept records around and didn't need to and could have um, discarded them, do so because you're going to have to go through them. You could potentially have to go through them in response to a right to no request. And again, I'm saying um, to discard those records in um, uh, compliance with laws that govern the retention of such records. The Pennsylvania uh, Historical I was messed up. Historical Museum Commission yeah. uh, Bureau of Archives of History. Yes, they have a great um, resource there and they oversee retention of letter of records and can give a lot of uh, guidance and help to you as you try to work through that. Yeah, they're a great group. There's also a municipal records guide that's online that uh, governs uh, like boroughs and townships, um, you know, for how long they should hold on to records and if they uh, adopt that guide then uh, it also gives them the freedom to dispose of records that they no longer need and have a legal basis for doing so. And they're very helpful with Commonwealth agencies as well. Yeah. I mean, they're, they, they're just a great resource Definitely. when it comes to retention. Um, Montgomery County versus Iverson. Um, this one, I'm not going to read the request, but it was for a number of emails related to domain names and uh, the court said not specific. Uh, and you can see that when you read it, it leaves you wondering what's being requested. Uh, and th this, to me, I look at this and think this is an example of what lacking specificity does not. It, the issue isn't, oh, this is going to be a ton of work. The issue is, what is it they want? I don't even know where to start with getting these records for this requester. And that's that is when you have a specificity problem. But it, the court said it was an open-ended request that gave little guidance. Like, you know, I was just saying that, you know, that may be burdensome, so burdensome that it would be considered overly broad. Um, uh, again, specificity in, in, in context. Um, there was no context given that they could work through this to try to figure it out. Uh, didn't have a time frame involved with it. So that complicated it even further. Um, See if this one's worth uh, another keyword one. Here's a office sought clarification. Okay, this is a good one to talk about. The emails were sent or received by a chief of staff from January to July. So roughly what six, seven months. Um, the office of the governor wasn't clear what was uh, requested. They asked for clarification. The requester gave uh, a list of keywords. And the court said that these keywords worked. Um, and it was because it was a finite time frame. The scope was limited to one person's email. And although the keyword list was lengthy and at times and in some respects broad, the narrow time frame and the scope of records, because it was only one person's email, and the agency's response upon getting the keyword list seemed to indicate they knew what was requested, um, they found that this was specific. So I would say in, in this situation, if you get a keyword um, case uh, and you get somebody who files a right to no request with you with keywords, this would be a good reference point. Um, I know we have a number of uh, keyword FDs in our, our keyword FDs in our um, database as well that you can search. And I would encourage that as a resource and we'll, we'll get to resources here. Here are two others that date back. Um, I'm not going to go over them. They can be um, referred to. They're also discussed in the Bagwell and Greel case as it came down recently, and they are included in that history and can give some guidance um, if your facts line up with theirs more similarly. 
just in, in tips in closing, requester, don't go on a fishing expedition with a net. Don't be trying to get everything. Don't, you know, sometimes we see requesters trying to track down a, a smoking a smoking gun, and they'll or they have an actual record in hand that they're trying to confirm that the agency is admitting they have. Um, if you have that, or if you have a source or something, you know, specifically ask. Uh, for that record, you, you know, use a fishing pole, not a net, is what I've heard uh, a right to know attorney in the area say, and I, I think it really exemplifies uh, what you're supposed to do there. Limit the subject matter in a meaningful way. Um, be realistic in what you request. You know, look at the size of your agency, whether it's large and it takes a lot of time for them to work through the right to know request, or if it's small and it's going to take them time. Um, don't. Um, be overbroad in your request. I want it all and I want it now. Uh, I want records that show the agency violated the law. You know, th those are um, unrealistic requests that we see uh, come up on appeal from time to time. And as George has emphasized, be willing to work with the agency, talk with them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's better to file a second more specific request a lot of times than appeal it um, from a time analysis standpoint. Um, and if you, you know, you file a second request, you're still getting a specificity argument. Okay, maybe it's time to have the OR take a look, but um, sometimes it might be more beneficial, like I said. And don't make discovery requests. And all those, all those um, requesters who are attorneys out there, discovery requests are great for discovery. They don't work in the right to know law. They are way too broad, generally speaking. You might have some that are okay. Agencies, avoid using specificity as a license to deny. Uh, don't every right to know request we get is not going to be specific. Don't say that. And don't don't try to formulate words. Um, example of one, you know, we look at the common meanings of words. Don't wordsmith. Uh, we had one come through uh, where the, the request was for attachments to emails, and we got an argument of how um, the word attachments was not um, specific enough. It's like we all know what an attachment to an email is. That is a specific type of document. So um, and like I said, there are a chain of 25 emails with 25 different people. Don't try to overinflate your numbers to try to make this request look like it's not specific enough. Um, a lot of times you may not have to do that because, you know, the request may be asking uh, for overly using overly broad terms. We uh, developed a specificity worksheet. Uh, it's on our website, it kind, of, it kind of like the thought process was to try to give a little bit of a checklist. This, this is it. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in any detail uh, with time, but it goes over everything we already talked about. Um, I think if you get this specificity worksheet, you get the Bagwell and the Brio case together, they can give you a lot of help on working through your requests as an agency to figure out if it indeed is specific. And if you're an aid, if you're a requester to draft a specific request, they can give you a lot of guidance. One of the things I encourage agencies to do is go find a request that is very similar to the one you have in our final determinations, and you can work off of that too. If it's a request that's phrased a different a certain way, you might be able to find something that's maybe it's never going to exactly be on point, but it could be very, very close, and you can use that as a reference point too. We walk through should it have a subject matter. We ask some questions that can help you hopefully work through it. And um, that is the specificity. Additional resources, like I just said, you can go to our docket search and look for specific um, cases that relate to specificity. Uh, we have a case law index. Um, many of the court cases, if not all the court cases listed here, are on are in that case law index. This webinar training will be posted, and there are others that are there. Our FAQs, we continue to develop them. They will address um, some of these specificity issues, uh, looking at how to file a request, how to file an appeal if you're a requester. And that is the end of it. Um, yeah, let me go back and uh, we'll take a look at some of these questions. Um, Greg, you had asked about uh, emails in Section 708. Uh, just because they're emails does not change whether or not they qualify under the definition of a record. So, you know, if you determine that uh, the content of the emails rises to the definition of a record, then, uh, yeah, your next step would be to uh, take a look at Section 708 to determine whether or not, in fact, it's a public record. 
Uh, Lexus and Christie, you kind of are touching on the same area, which is possession of the actual record. Uh, Alexis, if you, it, whether the record is uh, considered responsive or not, if you no longer have it in your possession, then you're not under any obligation uh, to provide it. It's going to come down as to whether or not you have the record, uh, you retain it or not, uh, as to whether you would include it in the response. I mean, you know, you can't provide a record that you don't have. Um, but to follow off that too, you, yeah. you need to be careful too, leading up to that, that you make sure you keep the record you're supposed to have. We don't have jurisdiction over if somebody deleted a record or an agency discarded records they should have kept. That gets into another... Uh, yeah, that's an issue outside of the right to law in our jurisdiction. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, and then uh, let's see here. Uh, sorry, the uh, you guys are typing in questions and it's messing up the advancing here. I'm trying to stay out. Okay, Christy, uh, the requester insists they exist, but they do not. Okay, it's the same issue. If you don't have the records in your possession, uh, then you know you really have no choice than to say that you don't have those records, and in effect you're denying the, the request. And if the appeal comes to us, we will look for you to provide. Um, and that is testimony attestation yeah. under penalty of perjury that they do not exist. Yeah. Okay, let me scroll back here a little bit more. Uh, ah, what's going on here? I think people are, I think they're exiting. Yeah, they're exiting, so it's messing up the uh, scrolling. Okay. Then, uh, I think, I don't know. I I think there's another there one here. Range time that would be, ah. Would there be a range of time for communications that would be considered too burdensome? Well, I think Nathan tried to address that. We don't have a specific uh, time frame. You know, there's nothing black and white that we could issue. You would have to look at the circumstances surrounding the request, uh, the the degree of uh, of how the factors would be applied, you know, the subject, the scope, and the time frame. And you'd have to break, you know. A, under that type of scenario, we would look at, you know, burdensome would probably be an element there since it's pretty clear, you know, what record, you know, here, here, let me put it this way. If you look at a right to know request and your first thought is, I have no idea what they want, um, I think you definitely got a specificity issue. Yeah, that goes back to section 701, yeah. doesn't the language? Yeah, there. so you've got, you know, I, I just don't know where to go with this. Then there's the, this is a ton of work. This is burdensome. This is going to take forever. In that situation, as an agency, you're going to have to demonstrate how the burdensome nature of that makes it overly broad. And I think through the, in the court cases, and you, have, you would have to go look at them to compare the volume in those cases where the court said it was specific enough. There, there was some very, there has been some very burdensome and voluminous requests that the court has said, you know what they want, you have to provide it, or you have to go through it and give them why it's not allowed to be released to the public under this exemption. Yeah, I mentioned uh, Section 701, and I think that's, uh, that's the whole foundation upon which this presentation is built. And I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially what it says is that the request needs to be sufficiently specific so that the person receiving the request, the, the arrow, can figure out what you're asking for. So, you know, that's that's what all this is based on. Uh, the link for the um, reach out to me directly. I I know that it was on our on the training website under annual training. I think it's in the frequently asked questions section as well. For the specificity, for the worksheet. specificity worksheet, um, it, I think it's on a couple different locations on the website. Um, but feel free to, you know, give the office a call, and I, I'll make sure you get that. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, in response to your uh, question about limiting the amount of requests, the answer is no. No, a person can file as many requests or request as many documents uh, as they see fit, uh, regardless of the time frame. And, and I would put a caveat on that is to um, we are seeing AI start to play a role in those. And if you have 
that type of appeal where you suspect someone's filing literally hundreds of requests with you in the space of two or three days, um, that would be an issue to um, potentially raise or at least alert the OR on because we're still navigating how that's all going to work. Thank you, Janelle. Janelle comes through as always. Um, specificity worksheets there on the on the website. Wasn't this just a, I'm reading uh, Mr. Gottlieb's question here. Wasn't this just recently addressed in a court yeah, decision? Oh, with an asynchronous of black specificity. Yeah, the new Brio case discusses that a little bit, but what agencies do is they will say it's not specific and then we don't have to raise exemptions um, when they're clearly on their face specific enough. So, uh, you know, it, it gets, it, you do get into an interesting back and forth there, but on a lot of those cases where we say you waived it, the courts have said that too, that you potentially waive, you know, your argument when you raise specificity or incorrect. Um, you know, some of these requests are on their face specific and the agency should have determined that it was specific enough. Yeah, uh, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because if that argument is discounted in the decision and you fail to raise other issues, then you may not get another bite of the apple. And that's why you should at a minimum do a quick look at all the records that are potentially responsive. And that's where that one case, and I, I don't have it in front of me right now. Let's see, was the, I think it was, was it Iverson? That but, sounds right. Um, you looked at the, the breakdown of the request and you go, huh? I mean, it had email, um, domain names and all that on it, but you're still sitting there thinking going, what what is it exactly that you want? Now, that's your specificity issue versus, wow, this is super burdensome. So if you know it's going to be super burdensome, at least look and have an idea of what exemptions are going to come into play uh, from a general overview. Because we have situations where agencies don't even go look, and there's sometimes they come back and say, oh, after we've litigated the case, oh, no records exist. And it's like you, sh you should have went and looked at the beginning before raising a specificity argument. Uh, Jenny, you're asking about retention policies. Uh, the resource we, ref we refer to is through the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, the Bureau of Archives and History State Records Center. Uh, you can drill down into their website and you'll find those resources. The Municipal Records Guide applies to uh, Commonwealth agencies. Well, I actually think there's a separate uh, uh, guide for Commonwealth agencies. And then uh, municipalities. I don't think we haven't been able to find anything comparable for school districts and authorities, but you'll find a guide there that basically says, look, here's the universe of records that you typically would have uh, possession of, and this is how long you need to hold on to them. Once that period has lapsed, then you're free to dispose of those records. You no longer are bound to retain them. Okay, so you'll find that uh, under uh, the State Records Center uh, website. And like Nathan was saying, they have a very helpful staff. They work with us and we put on some webinars uh, using their resources and people. Um, just to clarify, if the request is so unspecific that you cannot formulate a search, I mean, if it, like, I want all records of the agency, obviously you don't have to raise exemptions there because it's super broad. So if it's, if you're certain it's unspecific, and some of these, let's be, I mean, some of them, on their face, you know right off, this isn't specific. You don't you don't have to raise exemptions. I mean, we're just raising the warning that if you do go this, uh, the specificity route, that um, if you're wrong, you may waive your ability to raise exemptions. Could specificity be waived? Or that? Um, the issue of questions, I, I don't know. There's specific final terminations that address um, asking questions instead of um, seeking records. And those, um, we rule in favor of the agency on those. You're, you're not permitted to ask questions, you know, you're seeking records. And there's a number of final terminations that discuss that and what a requester should be doing um, and how to properly file a right to know request. So, um, 
Every so often you get a question that is clear enough that by reading the question, you can figure out what record the person is asking for. And uh, you know that's kind of the exception to the rule. But and, and again, as your and, and, you know, example, and this is a general, I'm not commenting on any specific case if this is a specific request before you, but um, why something is done yeah. requires judgment by the agency uh, to determine that. So yes, that would that would raise definite specificity issues because again, you're being asked to make a judgment uh, or to make an analysis as to why something was done versus I want all the records that show um, why a property was condemned. So even that's iffy, but you know, why a property is condemned versus, you know, elements that you know, the agency relies upon to condemn a property. But again, even that might require some analysis. So you see what I'm saying? As I work through this in my mind, you know, um, I want all records related to condemned properties. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that would probably be a good example of a uh, time to reach out to the yeah. requester and and, 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 and the person. And, yeah, and the person might file and ask for this information related to their specific condemned property, which would then, you know, allow you to maybe use the context uh, of the request to formulate your response. Yeah. Folks, any other questions before we wrap things up and in, uh, in the webinar? Now's the time to get them in. And you know, as always, if uh, if we end the session and something comes up and you have some further questions on what was presented, feel free to reach out to the office, you know, send us an email or you can call in and we'll do our best to get you steered in the right direction. Uh, like Nathan said, we can't provide legal advice, but many times there is existing precedent in one of our final determinations or a court case that uh, might be able to provide the guidance that you're looking for. Okay, looks like uh, we're done with the questions, so we're gonna uh, wrap up and log off. Folks, thank you for your participation today. Uh, it was great having all this attendance, and uh, uh, we hope to see you on the next one next week. Take care.